This is your first time checking out the Gig Geezer, or if you're a returning visitor of the Gig Geezer, hey, thanks for coming by. And if you would not mind, hit that subscribe button, give my content a thumbs up, share my content among others, and I definitely welcome comments in the section below. Now, the source of this segment of the Gig Geezer is born out of an online article that I happen to read um, during the week. And this article talks of Uber in New York City is suing an effort to block a rate hike that the city passed for its for rideshare drivers in that market in that area because uber felt the rate hike was unsupported dramatic and unprecedented new york city felt it was a move to attract more drivers to meet the increased rider demand for the apps of uber and lyft now new york city was saying in a nicer way that if you want these people to use your app, you need to pay the people who's going to be driving these people around. That's a nice way of what they were saying. Now, the increased, the increases, the rate increases involved um, increasing the uh, per minute rate by 7.42% and the per mile rate by 23.9%. On these apps, at least currently now, drivers are basically paid based on time and distance. There was a time when drivers were paid based on a percentage of the fare. And I've shared on and I shared on this segment of the gig geezer, at least I refer to in this segment of the gig geezer, how I made $180 driving a rider from the Columbia Airport to the Atlanta Airport. And then a lady from <clears throat> the Columbia train station, um, down to southeast georgia brunswick georgia that is and i made 220 dollars on it on both of those rides i i made 75 i made 75 percent of the fare that's right now there were drivers who were before who came onto the app before me i came onto the app in september 2016 on uber and officially began taking rides on the Lyft app in January 2017. Those before me were make were making more than that. They were making 80% of the fares. And that since, since has changed. Now, if I were to if I were to put those numbers into something that you can kind of wrap your head around, while the New York rates are different from the Columbia rates, and for that matter, even within South Carolina, the rates in Columbia are different from Myrtle Beach and then from Charleston and then from Greenville Spartanburg. But in the Columbia market, drivers on the Lyft app, for example, are paid 11 cent a minute and 75 cent a mile. If you were to increase that per minute rate by 7.42%, it may move it up to 12 cent a minute. And then if you increase the miles rate, it would increase it from 75 cent a mile to probably about 93 cent, somewhere is about a mile. Now, the miles would be significant, but the question would be, well, since we're dealing with Uber and Lyft, what would they take away in order to keep the base rate about the same? What would they take away to make sure the drivers are basically making no more than what they've been making, although they're getting a higher rate? Those are some of the things that we have to deal with. But this speaks to a larger conversation. We've been, I've been saying for some time that these apps look at us drivers as means of a necessary evil. And when you're in a situation like that, it is incumbent upon us to use these apps to our advantage for as long as we can. My grandmother once asked me, somewhere about 50 years ago, she asked me, what's opportunity? What do you think opportunity is? Now I'm thinking along the lines of some Webster dictionary definition as in terms of chance and perhaps good fortune. But she looked at me, she said, no, that's not it, little boy. Opportunity knocks. And it's this person with long hair. And when you see that person, you grab on, and get as much as you can and hold on to it as, lo as long as you can. Because opportunity is going to go on to someone else. 
That was 50 years ago. And this is the first time I've really shared something like this in that in that in in almost 50 years, in fact. And it kind of makes sense. And bear with me. And by the way, if you like the content that's been provided in this segment, the gig geezer, or in any other segment, the gig geezer, hey, hit that subscribe button. Give my content a thumbs up. Share my content among others, and I definitely want your comments in the section below. There's no doubt that various iterations of gig economy opportunities will come and go. And it seems the best opportunities are always in the beginning because that's when companies are trying to establish their brand and establish their product and establish some type of market share. That's when they're paying people to get on that app. That was the case with Uber and Lyft. That was when, at least in that iteration of its business model, they were paying drivers 80% and then 75%, and then the numbers kept dropping to where I understand that basically drivers are making half of what they made according to those base rates. And um, it is what it is, I suppose. Going back over that New York City example, if they're increasing the um, minute rate by 7.42%, and the mileage rate by 23.9%, it is estimated that Uber, for example, would be paying about another 21 to $25 million a year more in driver pay. Uber does not want to pay that additional 21 to $25 million because they say that they would have to pass that increase on to the riders. Whatever, okay. But... Again, if I use the examples in my market, it may make the per mile rate go up to 12 cent a mile, in, uh, uh, 12 cent a minute, that is. The per minute rate goes up to 12 cent a minute, and then the per mile rate go from 75 to 93 cent per mile. Well, those would actually put you numbers on par with when I really was doing rideshare back in 2017 and 2018. That's all they're doing is turning the clock back a few years. That just goes to show you how much these apps have taken away from us drivers. That's what it's showing. But then there's these gig food delivery apps. And while the golden era for rideshare, arguably in the South Carolina market, was between 2014 and 2016, the golden era for the gig food delivery was born out of major socioeconomic situation. And that, that, era kicked in in mid-March when um, at that time Grubhub was clinging on to its to a number one market share but door but Grubhub was overtaken and surpassed by DoorDash that year um, in March 2020 we are talking about the pandemic shutdowns and it could be said that a boom for gig food delivery drivers occurred and during that time, if you recall, we were seen as essential people who were able to go out and about and not having to deal with the curfews and so forth. But there were some factors that also contributed to the money that we were making. And there were factors that were contributing to why people were spending the money that they were. First of all, customers had no choice. They had to depend on people like me and you to bring them food and their groceries. Secondly, there was stimulus money to spend. And from what I recall, a lot of people bought cars too, and a lot, a lot of other uh, I, big, big ticket items and so forth. But there was stimulus money to spend, and then there was also the temporary unemployment money to spend. And for some people, the temporary unemployment money was better than what they were making on their job before the shutdowns. But now we are right upon 2023. None of those none of those conditions exist. In fact. People have options now. They are flocking to the restaurants and to the stores. There is no stimulus money. And um, it can be said, too, that uh, people's money is kind of funny once again, as there are persistent concerns uh, about recession and inflation. Now, there's talk of inflation may ease in 2023, but there's no certainty no assurance that of indicators that a recession may not occur in 2023. Also, now, I've also mentioned in this segment of the Gig Geezer about how apps like DoorDash, Grubhub, and Uber Eats are in the, between the crosshairs of the Department of Labor as the Department of Labor is 
got a proposal on hand in which it would reclassify us gig food delivery drivers, not as independent contractors, but as employees. The reason being is because of the way DoorDash and Grubhub and Uber Eats have, and the like have done everything they can to muddy the definition of being an independent contractor. Now, I shared in this segment of the gig user that you're already an employee if you're doing certain things. And what did I mean? You're doing exactly what DoorDash wants you to do when you make that effort to accept, accept more orders to supposedly earn more money. You're, you're doing exactly what DoorDash wants you to do when you are making every effort to maintain that high, high acceptance rate. Yes, I know that there's drivers out there who say that they are showing others how to maximize their experience on the app. And yes, I know there are those out there who are speaking of the platitudes, speaking or making platitudes of how they love their independence and they love their autonomy out there when they're working the DoorDash app and similar apps. But you may have to figure out another strategy if and when another economic slowdown occurs or another ma major economic shift occurs. Another major economic shift could be if gas prices take off or inflation takes off again. And not only that, let's just talk in a more practical term. Your 70% or higher acceptance rate won't help you if by some chance your metrics are outside of the acceptable parameters, which may trigger the algorithm on these apps to flag your account. Now, what do I mean by that? Translated, your 70% or higher acceptance rate and all the platitudes of you enjoying your independence and autonomy on the app while you're mining for carbon crystals won't help you if you're deactivated by some chance and you damn sure know that doordash ain't going to listen to you if you put in an appeal now again if other economic factors are present having an ex having a 70 percent or higher acceptance rate may or may not help you in fact maintaining a 95 percent acceptance rate on the grubhub app may not help you. Um, also, um, as you well know, at certain times of the year, there's already drop-offs in customer activity. And they usually go in stretches of about four to six weeks out of a year. If those occur, what are you going to do? What will you do? Now, by the way, if you like the content that's been provided in this segment of the Gig Geezer or in any other segment of the Gig Geezer, hit that subscribe button. Give my content a thumbs up, share my content among others, and I definitely welcome your comments in the section below. Now I'm going to talk in terms of someone who's got a few decades behind him. In fact, I shouldn't say a few decades. I got several decades behind me. Now what I've come to realize is that money that you make on apps like DoorDash and Grubhub, Uber Eats and Instacart and the like, that's fast money. And I've learned since childhood that fast money spends as fast as you make it. And while I can say that I've benefited from the gig economy, working primarily f gig food delivery apps and previously rideshare, I've also known how, and I've also shared how it's put me in a position to improve my credit by 200 points or more since 2018. But this is something else that I've come to learn. And it's, it's only come lately that I've realized these things that I'm about to share. DoorDash is not something that you can plan your retirement around. Now, if you're retired, you can use apps like DoorDash and Grubhub and Uber Eats and Instacart as something as a means of having extra income. But you're in a position if you're trying to work towards retirement and because of the shift in jobs, in fact, in fact, I saw something earlier today on another um, YouTube channel. They shared based on certain studies back in 1962, the average stay uh, an employee stayed on a job. A single job was 33 years. So basically, when they got hired, they retired there. In 1980 or 90, in 1990, the average stay on a job was 20 years. And now in 2022, the average stay on the job is 10 years. So people aren't staying on these jobs that long for whatever reason. It could be that they got better job opportunity or they got pissed off or 
or the jobs, the job security of business of, of the employer being in business may not be there as it was for 30, 40, 50 years ago. But for whatever reason, people are not on a job as long as they used to be. So you can't plan your retirement on and based on current numbers. You, you, I mean, retirement may not be a thing of the, of the immediate future. But that said, DoorDash is not something that you can plan your retirement around. And if you're in, and this is something else that I've learned lately. If you're an independent contractor, and if you are in, truly in business for yourself, if you're in business for yourself, if you're an independent contractor, that means you have something that you can pass along to a relative, a spouse, or children. It also means that if you're in business for yourself, or you're an independent contractor, if you really got a business, that means you've got some type of an asset. And an asset is something that you can sell. Okay? For example, I'm an insurance agent. I've shared this many a times. I've got a book of business, about a couple hundred thousand. If I were to decide to get out the insurance business and all, I can sell my book of business to another agent and make some money off of it. Can you sell your 70% or higher acceptance rate to someone else? Can you sell your um, your account on that fucking app to someone else? No, you can't do that. But these apps say that you're an independent contractor. You're in business for yourself, basically. You're running your own business. Not really. If you're in business for yourself, you'd be able, you'd be, you would be putting yourself in a position to where you can accrue more things, accumulate more things, or expand in other areas. And that's something that I don't think a lot of people see. Then that's where I get back to the term about um, fast money spends as fast as you get it. What are you doing with the money that you are making on these apps? Now, I know that there are some, uh, there have been some content creators that have posed these type of questions to you. Do you have an exit plan? Are you look, do you have something in mind that you're going to move on to another level or get moved beyond the DoorDash, Grubhub, Uber Eats, or Uber or Lyft apps? Another reality is that you can't bequeath DoorDash or Grubhub or Uber Eats to anyone unless you've got stock in DoorDash or Uber or Lyft. Then you can be bequeath your stock to them, but you can't bequeath your 70% acceptance rate status. You can't, your, your diamond status or, door, or top dasher status, you can't bequeath none of that shit. In the real business world, what we do is worthless. That's another way of seeing it. What we do is worthless. It's almost, as no, it's almost no better than the paper that it's made on. And so, you know, this is where opportunity comes in. I use the example of opportunity. You grab onto it, you hold onto it as long as you can, you get as much as you can, and then it's going to go on to somewhere else. So what are you going to, what are you doing with this opportunity? So that brings me to the next point. In this segment of the Gig Easer, I talked about how you need to make DoorDash, how to make DoorDash your business. It's not so much as me talking about because I'm working the DoorDash app, I'm working my business. No, it's about what you're doing behind the scenes. That's what makes it your business. And I spoke of about um, establishing a business name and getting and, and um, opening business checking accounts. Those are some of the things that I was talking about at a base level. All right, so that brings me to something I've noticed that a few content creators have posed out there among us viewers and among us fellow content creators. Can you create life beyond DoorDash, Grubhub, UBreeds, Instacart, and the like? And so that means what is your exit strategy? Do you even have one? Can you create life beyond DoorDash, Grubhub, UBreeds? That's the question, right? Um, now, yes, independence, as we know, is nice. Autonomy, as we know, is nice. And those are things that I like when I'm out there as well. I'm and I'm not one for some. I am not one who likes someone looking over my shoulder. When it's, um, I've been in job situations where it feels as if I'm having to look over my shoulder, or somebody's looking over my shoulder, 
I get I, I I just I just don't like that. I've been one who likes my autonomy and independence. And I'm not for one who may be blatantly pimping me as what can occur on these apps as well. One thing that I've come to realize with these apps is that there's only so much money you can make working them. And if you're in a market that where you can make eight thousand a month or more, good for you. But I've got to ask, how many hours are you working each week? How many days a week are you working? Recently, I saw a driver show that he made over $2,100 one week working multiple apps, but he put in about 75 hours, meaning that he probably put in at least six days a week. So that means he's putting in 12 hour days, 12 hour plus days. And from what I know about him, he's at least half my age. But I'm going to ask this question. How long can you put in those consecutive 12-hour days? And how long can you put in those consecutive 75-hour weeks? I've shared personally how I've made anywhere between twelve dollars and $1,500 a week in my market, the Columbia, South Carolina metropolitan area. And my, usual, man, my work week usually runs anywhere between 35 and 45 hours a week. But usually it's anywhere between 40 and 42 hours and I work anywhere between five and six days a week. And while those are nominal numbers in the gig economy, particularly for gig food delivery, I'm also beginning to realize that I'm only going to make so much in a year doing this. And I'll give you some examples. These are just my last three um, calendar years, or last three tax years, including this year now. In 2020, I made... Over 67,500 just on gig food delivery apps and the like. And overall, 10 th and my overall 1099 earnings was at about 75,000. In 2021, I made um, over $70,600 on gig food delivery apps and the like. And I made over 77,000 in total 1099 earnings. Now, by the way, these are not official 1099 statement earnings, um, but it's a good indicator. And so far this year, as of December 13, 2022, I had made over 68,300 on gig food delivery apps and right at about 74,000 overall for 1099 earnings. Now, from what I understand, what I've made so far this year and what I've made in previous years, that's on the high end of the gig food delivery worker scale. The average is about 45800 or about $880 a week, or based on a 40-hour week, about $22 an hour. And, by the way, if you like the content that's been provided in this segment of the Gig Geezer or in any other segment of the Gig Geezer, hit that subscribe button. Give my content a thumbs up. Share my content among others, and I definitely welcome your comments in the section below. So the question I ask you is, can you take that step away from DoorDash, Grubhub, Uber Eats, or Instacart and the like? Are you in a position to make that move? Would you be willing to make that move? Or if the opportunity presented itself, would you? And with that, this is yet another segment of the Gig Geezer. I'm in Wood Lane, and as always, may your hustle and may your grind continue.